Syphilis cases are rising at an alarming rate in Canada and globally. Planned Parenthood says Saskatchewan is leading the country in syphilis rates. The numbers have increased 900 percent in the last five years. For more on this and other topics, let's bring in Dr. Isaac Bogoch. He is an infectious disease specialist with Toronto General Hospital. Dr. Bogoch, thank you for joining us. Uh, tell us how is syphilis spreading and what are the symptoms to watch out for? Yeah, syphilis is primarily a sexually transmitted infection, uh, so it is spreading through sexual contacts. And of course, it can still be transmitted from uh, mother to child in utero, but the main mode of transmission really is sexual. And you know, the, the symptoms are, are pretty clear. You know, at the site of inoculation, people will get uh, a, a sore. It's also called a chancre. It sometimes it can look like an ulcer. Sometimes people might have a fever. Uh, swollen lymph nodes, a headache associated with this. If it really goes for a long, long period of time, you can have uh, longer term manifestations, including neurologic injury, and people might have challenging challenges with walking. There might be cognitive uh, issues. There might be cardiac and uh, cardiovascular issues as well with long term untreated syphilis. And tell me, Dr. Bogoch, it is, of course, treatable in adults, but it's much more dangerous in babies. Health Canada is reporting the number of babies born with syphilis has increased dramatically over the past five years. What is causing this sharp rise in natal cases? Yeah, this is very troubling. And as you point out, syphilis is not hard to diagnose and it's not hard to treat. It's, the treatment is penicillin. I mean, we, it's, it's very easy to treat, in fact. Uh, so this is very troubling to hear a rise in neonatal cases of syphilis because it can cause significant harm to a developing fetus. And of course, it can cause permanent damage. So certainly it can cause fetal demise. It can cause premature births. If a child is born with, with uh, syphilis, there can be uh, significant neurologic manifestations and bone manifestations. It can result in cognitive delay and cognitive decline. Uh, and, and bone abnormalities. And again, this is completely preventable. And a lot of this, sadly, is due to barriers to care, uh, challenges accessing care, uh, public health resources as well. And really, these are typically more vulnerable individuals. For example, uh, people experiencing homelessness, uh, people who are unable to access care, who are not getting tested or treated for syphilis early in pregnancy. If, if syphilis is diagnosed and treated before 20 weeks, you can really uh, mitigate most of these uh, significant manifestations. But of course, that means you have to access care. You have to ensure that people come to care, get the appropriate screening and get the appropriate treatment. And there certainly are significant barriers to care, not just in Canada, but globally as well. As you were just saying, I guess some public health measures so that, that mothers who may be in disadvantaged situations can have the same kind of testing and care as, as mothers who have a, a regular doctor. Uh, tell me, switching topics now, COVID-related hospitalizations continue to decline, so that's good news. But uh, the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations is recommending that Canadians get another booster shot this fall. Are boosters really necessary at this point? I feel like a lot of people have that question right now. Yeah, it's a great point. So, I mean, it's great to see that most of the trends right now are headed in the right direction. If you look across the country and you look at, for example, wastewater surveillance, it's relatively low uh, in much of the country. Hospitalizations continue to decline in much of the country. But that, of course, doesn't mean COVID is gone. It's still here. There's just less of it now than there was, for example, uh, you know, many months ago. So that's, that's obviously good news. But again, it's still here. It's still around. And we know we're going to see more of it in the fall and winter season. So, we also know who's more vulnerable to COVID. We know certain groups, for example, people on the older end of the spectrum, people with underlying medical conditions, various groups of people who live in, for example, nursing homes or long-term care facilities. Like these are groups that are much more at, uh, at a greater risk for having more severe manifestations of the virus. And you know, based on some recent uh, nasty communications, it looks like we're gonna get some new booster vaccines available probably sometime in the fall. Uh, they're gonna recommend that people you know, come out and get it, but they especially recommended that those who are more vulnerable to severe infections, people over the age of 65, people with underlying medical conditions, indigenous communities, people who reside in long-term care facilities, a few other groups as well. It's especially recommended that those groups and those individuals receive the booster vaccine. And tell me, Dr. Bogoch, Health Canada is recalling several energy drinks over concerns. Some cans contain more caffeine than is allowed. Canada's caffeine limitation is 180 milligrams for a caffeinated energy drink. Some drinks like Prime Energy are about 20 milligrams over that. 
It doesn't sound like a lot, but what kind of an impact can that have on our bodies? So for starters, that's a lot of caffeine. Like when you think about what's in a cup of coffee, that could be about 70 to 140 milligrams of caffeine, tea, anywhere about 30 to 50 milligrams, a can of Coke, about 30 to 40 milligrams of caffeine. Okay, so these are drinks that are at 200 milligrams of caffeine, and that's still 20 milligrams over the limit of 180 milligrams. That's a, even at 180 milligrams, that's a lot of caffeine to pack into a drink. Anyways, you can get headaches, palpitations, insomnia, you can exacerbate anxiety, you can get a, a high heart rate. Like There are certainly symptomatic manifestations of, of this. So I think that's a pretty reasonable thing to do. We've got to watch our caffeine intake. For somebody, a coffee lover like myself, this, those are some very, very sobering numbers. Dr. Isaac Bogoc, thank you so much for making time for us and uh, clarifying some of these issues for us. We will be back in just a moment. Thank you.